Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Jamie Furr. I'm the president of the Selective Mutism Association. So glad all of you could join us today. Um, this webinar is brought to you by the Selective Mutism Association and was made possible as well by a generous grant from the Gordon and Marilyn Macklin Foundation. Um, so we are very fortunate today um, to have Dr. Shelley Avney with us to present on practical applications to enhance motivation in the treatment of adolescents with selective mutism. Dr. Avney is a clinical psychologist and is the founder of the Child and Adolescent Anxiety Practice, or CAP, in Manhattan, New York, um, and is a specialist in the assessment and treatment of anxiety disorders in children and adolescents. And she also founded the We Speak program. Um, which is a first, one of the first behavioral group programs for teens with selective mutism. Um, we're also lucky to have Dr. Allison Miller, who will be moderating our program today. And she's a licensed psychologist in Baltimore, Maryland, and she owns a group practice specializing in anxiety disorders in children and adolescents, with a particular emphasis on selective mutism. So welcome to both of you, and I will let them go ahead and take over um, today's webinar. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Jamie. Hi, everyone. Um, so just a few housekeeping notes before we turn it over to Dr. Abney. Um, the presentation has been made available on the webinar, so there should be um, an icon, a document icon, where you can um, click on it and download the presentation if you'd like to have it. Um, and secondly, please submit questions um, for Dr. Abney. We definitely want to be able to um, make this interactive and answer specific questions that you have that come up. Um, there is a button that it should be very obvious to submit a question. I will receive it and then I'll go through the questions and ask them to Dr. Abney as appropriate either during the presentation or at the end. Any questions that we don't get to will be answered um, directly via email to the person who asked it within the next days or, or coming weeks. Um, so. Thank you so much, Dr. Avni, for um, presenting this to us, and I'm excited to hear all of your great information. So, turning it over to you. Yeah, well, thank you for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me to do the webinar. Um, so, as, as many of you probably actually came about because Dr. Miller had posed a question on the listserv um, about uh, struggling with some teen cases that she had in terms of motivation. Um, and it turns out that um, a bunch of other clinicians chimed in and were having similar struggles. Um, so this seems like a very relevant topic um, and, and one that I'm excited to share strategies about. Um, I, got, I actually got into this line of work and into kind of this specific area around teen motivation for that reason, um, that you know it, it can be very challenging. Um, so I'm excited to be doing this. All right. Um, as Dr. Fur mentioned, um, we would like to thank the Gordon and Marilyn Macklin Foundation for the grant that made this possible. Um, so I would love for this to be as interactive as possible. And I know um, people are probably going to have a number of questions as I am um, explaining everything and going through the slides. So as Dr. Miller mentioned, she'll be kind of fielding the questions um, and I'll be stopping at different points. And I want to be sure to leave time at the end for um, question and answer. So we'll be going through the material, um, but I do want to make sure that um, I'm incorporating your questions as well into it. So we'll start off just in talking about motivation as a necessary treatment factor. Then we'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges in motivating adolescents, um, specifically ones with selective mutism. Then we'll talk about building uh, pre-treatment motivation, um, including parent collaboration and what I call prep sessions. Then we'll talk a little bit about building motivation into treatment. And then, like I said, we'll leave time for some question and answer at the end. Okay, so what we know about motivation is that it's really um, a critical component in treatment. And it's often overlooked because we know that, um, that we have really good uh, skills and strategies. Um, and, and that's true for selective mutism. We have a lot of really great treatment um, strategies in uh, treating this population. And so 
we know that we have the treatment in place um, and yet without motivation, the treatment is not going to be successful. Um, and so it's something that is often not considered because we're so proud of the techniques that we have, um, but really the motivation and treatment engagement is as important, if not more important than the techniques themselves. Um, so the impact of low motivation can be a poor therapeutic alliance, um, which then might result in lower engagement and more generally, um, it can, can kind of hamper learning skill acquisition and application of skills outside of therapy, which is most important, um, as we know, kind of the primary goal, especially in treating um, kids with selective mutism, is that we want to promote generalization where they're able to um, do the work independent of us in between sessions. Um, and so if we're not getting that, then um, the success is going to be pretty low. So adolescence is an interesting time, um, and the unique developmental characteristics of adolescents can make them particularly difficult to engage um, in treatment. And so this is some of the reasons that it might be especially hard um, to get um, adolescents on board with treatment. So as we know, adolescence is a time where they are really wanting to explore um, their independence and freedom um, and kind of have more control over their lives um, and pull back from parents and um, other authority figures in general. And so they might be resistant in to a decision by others um, for them to get help. And this isn't necessarily specific just to um, getting help. They are often resistant to any suggestions by other adults. Um, and so certainly a suggestion to get help or to do something hard, um, they're gonna be even more resistant to. Um, at the same time, because they have this drive to be independent um, and kind of do things themselves, then that might translate to them really wanting to solve problems themselves. Um, but they are often unable to solve this. SM is a pretty big problem. Um, and so they're often unable to solve the, those problems themselves, but um, have difficulty um, kind of admitting that they might need others' help in doing so. They also have a reduced capacity for self-reflection, um, so they might not experience their problem as needing treatment. They might minimize the negative consequences of anxiety, or they may be afraid to give up maladaptive coping strategies. Um, this is all tied into avoidance, and I'll talk a little bit later um, when I talk about the prep sessions about how I end up addressing um, this with the teens, because I do want to be kind of direct um, in um, understanding why there might be some resistance there and be able to address that directly with them. The third issue here is um, is related to stigma. So as we know, there still unfortunately is stigma around mental illness. Um, and this is exacerbated um, among adolescents because this is also a time when they are maybe not comfortable with their identity, still kind of trying to figure out who they are. Um, there's a lot of kind of insecurity and self-consciousness during this time, and they often don't want to be kind of perceived as different. Um, and so, SM makes this very challenging because there's such a low prevalence um, around SM that they likely have not met another kid um, who has selective mutism or um, they, you know, they might not even have heard of it other than in relation to themselves. Um, and so it often makes them feel like they're the only ones who have it. Um, and again, this might then kind of create a wall in terms of um, any sort of receptiveness to getting help for it. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, pre-treatment preparation here. Actually, I'm going to talk a lot about pre-treatment preparation um, because this is where you get the bulk of your motivation. Um, if you dive right into treatment before 
there is any level of motivation, um, it's going to be really hard to recover from that. And you're you're starting from um, from kind of a dangerous point that is that you're not going to be able to come back from. Um, and so this is kind of the critical. Um, this is the critical part in terms of building motivation is before treatment even starts. And I'm not saying that during this part you want them to be, you know, rejoicing that they're going to be participating in treatment, um, but you do need some level of motivation before you're starting at all with them. So <clears throat> I start off every SM case um, just with the parents. And this is different for other populations where um, with other diagnoses, I involve the teen in the intake um, and they're, you know, kind of a part of the process from the beginning. Um, but with teens with selective mutism, um, if we're thinking about motivation and we want to start them off in kind of a low pressure situation, an intake is probably not the best way to do that um, as intakes for a kid with selective mutism who is highly anxious and easily overwhelmed um, is going to feel very high pressure to them. Um, and that's the point at which you might lose them. Um, so, I typically will just meet with the parents. Um, the other thing is that you're probably not going to get a ton of information from um, a teen with SM anyway, um, as they're often um, they often have a lot of difficulty in um, being able to kind of reflect on their own anxiety and share information about their own anxiety. Um, and so certainly in the beginning, before they even have treatment, this is going to be very challenging for them. So if we're not getting information from them and we are, um, you know, just kind of creating additional pressure and starting off in a way that that seems overwhelming to them, um, then then we're not starting off kind of on the right foot. So I'm just starting with parents. Um, and in addition to the diagnostic interview and um, just the background history, I focus on two other pieces of information that I want to get here. One is in identifying impairments meaningful to the teen and not the parent. So the parent might say, you know, I really want my teen to have more friends. Um, might be true that they don't have a lot of friends, um, but if that's not something that they are invested in or wanting, then you know that's not going to do anything in terms of motivation. So we really want to find out where the impairments. Um, lie from the kid's perspective. Um, and this might be if, you know, if there's a kid who um, who is very invested in school and in getting good grades and maybe their grades are suffering because they are getting points deducted for um, class participation or um, because they are not able to ask for help. Um, that's something that we would want to kind of use as a hook if that's something that um, they're feeling impacted by, even if the parent feels like um, there's something that's more important. So we want to find out out what has the teen um, almost like complained about or expressed any sort of distress about or you know I wish blank was different um, and then we want to identify all the ways in which the parent is enabling um, I'm going to change that to parents slash teachers slash any other adult in their system um, so it might be the case where the teen might actually not feel any interference um, and they are comfortably living their lives um, and this this could very well be because they are enabled which really removes any feeling of um, that interference or distress and so if this is happening and we kind of have that combination of the parents or other adults um, really uh, enabling and removing the possibility of the teen feeling any sort of distress or any sort of interference um, and therefore the teen is not going to be motivated then um, we have to address that through parent sessions first and so there are a 
fair number of cases actually um, where if I get to this point and I see that the teen really is is not motivated um, and that's through gathering information from the parent um, and that there's a lot of um, enabling that explains the lack of motivation, then I will only do parent sessions focusing on removing some of or reducing some of those um, accommodations, um, shifting attention so that they're more focused on um, some of the positive approach behaviors and removing attention um, to the avoidance behaviors and ultimately just making it less comfortable for the teen um, to be to, to have selective mutism and um, to you know to be kind of manifesting um, the symptoms and and maintain their symptoms um, because if they are comfortable then there's of course they're not going to be motivated there's no reason to change um, if they are comfortable but if the parents and teachers and other adults start to remove some of those accommodations that had that have made them comfortable then their motivation is going to increase um, to work on it dr abney i i did want to i want to throw in a personal question here we actually haven't gotten many questions at all from the audience so please don't hesitate audience to send your questions in um, but i did want i love that you sort of changed the wording on what you had written on the slide you said um, i want to make this about all the adults in the kids life so not just the parents but also the teachers and that is a real sticking point for me a lot of times is is working with um the school to lessen accommodations because often a teen comes to me and they may have been with a wonderful caring therapist before but who maybe didn't understand so much about sort of that balance between accommodation and enabling and got them great accommodations through 504 plans or on ieps where the, the teen is basically not expected to provide anything verbal whatsoever in school. So I find that even for those teens who are super motivated to perform well academically, they're not uncomfortable at all because they're not getting points off for anything. They're not expected to do anything verbal at school. And it can be so tough at the high school level to get teachers to like have to pay attention to the nuances of can we you know ask a forced choice question can you you know role play in advance with them what you're going to ask and have them respond so i'm just wondering if you have any words of wisdom about working with the school to go from no expectations of the child to an appropriate level of increasing expectations yeah no it's a great question and it's something that i definitely have had to address in the past for that reason i think that um Schools are very well intentioned and they think that they are doing what's best for the teen by removing all of those expectations. Um, and so I think what, you know, when they are doing that and they have been doing that, I think, you know, it's it's not because they feel like um, you know, they they feel like this is how it should be. They they just feel like they're helping the teen. Um, and so in in those scenarios, I think it's just a matter of training and really helping them understand kind of the um, the detriment of, um, of, you know, kind of continuing to not place any expectations um, that they, that the teen advance verbally. Um, and this can be done, you know, I mean, I often have a point person or a liaison who I'm working with at the school. And so, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to talk to all the teachers. Um, in this case, in other cases, when, when you're working on other kind of intervention techniques than you do. Um, but in this case, in just kind of changing, um, some sort of expectation um, that might be a part of a 504 plan or a part of um, an IEP. So I've actually had um, IEP goals changed to if you know if it said that they're not expected to um, you know to give any sort of oral response. Um, I've had the IEP goals changed so that there's different expectations at different points of the year. Um, and so they're actually kind of like setting benchmarks of by this point, this is the expectation, then by this point, this is the expectation. Um, and 
they're usually on board with it once they understand that the goal isn't, you know, just to take away any expectation and just take away all of their anxiety, but the goal is actually, um, you know, to get them to increasingly be able to verbally communicate. Um, and I, I mean, I often will tell the school that, you know, this is, especially in high school, I mean, this is preparing them to, you know, to kind of be in the outside world. And, and this is their last opportunity to really kind of get this scaffolded practice in, um, in, you know, verbally communicating. And so if they don't have any of that practice in high school, then, you know, I mean, it's, it's setting them up for failure. Um, once they, you know, once they finish and are out on their own. And so that's usually a way to kind of get the school on board when they feel, when they feel kind of the pressure of like, oh, okay, well, this is on us then. The guilt. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. That that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay. <clears throat> so the, um, the prep sessions that I do, this is something that I started doing as part of my We Speak program. Um, and the main reason I did it was because I had families coming from afar and before they traveled, um, you know, across the country and um, planned to be in New York for two weeks, I, I wanted the kid to be able to meet me and, um, and verbalize, you know, at least once to me. But what I started to see is, um, not only you know was it helpful for that context but it really was helpful for every single sm teen that i have and so now i actually use these no matter what if the family is local um even you know pre-covid when we were doing office sessions back in the day um i still will use this um because it, it is just so it's remarkable what it does for motivation. Um, I've actually collected data on um, on looking at motivation levels before and after the prep sessions, and um, it it shows that these are very effective in uh, just increasing motivation. So, <clears throat> what these are are just very brief um, video sessions with the parent and the teen um, that are very low pressure. Um, and so the reason that these, uh, one of the reasons that these are so, are so important is because as we know, kids with SM um, have a high level of anxiety. Um, and one of kind of the sources of, of that anxiety for kids with anxiety in general, but definitely for kids with SM, um, is is an, uh, kind of not having certainty or um, not knowing what to expect. And so when we're thinking about um, a kid with SM who is really anxious and we're asking them to come in for the first time to a new location with a new person um, in with a new structure and, you know, not knowing kind of what to expect out of the structure or what sort of content is even going to be discussed, um, that's going to be completely overwhelming to them and they're going to put up a wall um, and that's kind of how they're coming into the first session is just feeling completely overwhelmed. Um, and with all of these different factors involved in uncertainty, and they're also probably catastrophizing, thinking that every single one of these variables is going to be way worse than it actually is. Um, and so what the prep sessions do um, is kind of allow for uh, the different areas of uncertainty to be broken down um, so that we're only maybe um, including one or two of those levels of uncertainty um, and otherwise giving them kind of uh, more comfort in starting with you um, with, you know, certain, certain variables. So I always have the parent tell the teen in advance that they're not going to be asked any questions. Um, and they are not going to have any expectation to speak in this first session. And it's just going to be about them seeing me, getting to know me, and hearing a little bit about what we're going to do. Um, and so, again, this instead of kind of the overwhelming nature of um, all of these kind of unknowns, um, they're, they're at, starting at their home with their parent um, in sort of like a brief 
starting point um, versus coming in for like a you know 50 minute hour long session. Um, and so it really kind of lowers the pressure um, and makes that starting point a little bit easier for them. Um, okay, so I, I thought it would be most helpful to actually kind of walk you through what one of these prep sessions looks like. So um, again, the teen and the parent are together. Um, and the different skills that are used here are all pulled from um, motivational interviewing um, and adapted for SM um, populations. And so I can, as I'm going through it, um, kind of just weave in what skill is being used um, in, that, in that moment. So I always start off just introducing myself um, and explaining kind of who I am and what I do. And in that, I'm really emphasizing my job is to work with kids just like you who um, have similar struggles. Um, and again, this, this kind of addresses the um, idea that we were talking about before that they often feel alone or like they're the only ones who are struggling with this. Um, and so I often, I mean, that's kind of the first shift that I see um, with teens is when I explain that, you know, this is what I do and that I work with kids who um, are their age, who have very similar struggles. And I even will kind of connect some of their own impairments to other kids that I work with and um, so they're able to see that not only do I work with other, other teens with SM, but I also work with teens who are struggling with very similar issues. Um, so then I do um, some, some validating of their resistance. And so I'll say that I completely, I understand that almost all teens, I, I often keep it to teens instead of you, um, almost all teens don't want to be seeing me. <laughs> and so I'll, I'll, you know, get kind of humorous here um, and a little, a little sarcastic and um, say like, I, I totally get it. Um, you know, you have things that you'd rather be doing. Um, and almost every teen who comes to me feels the exact same way. So we're kind of breaking the ice there um, and addressing the elephant in the room. Um, that they that they don't want to be there so that they don't feel like they need to kind of put on um, this facade um, of needing to please. Um, and then I explain to them that I hear from a lot of teens that um, that they feel like they don't need it um, or they feel like they're fine with the way it is because I this is something that I want to address head on um, because that's one of the main, areas of resistance is I'm saying I don't need it. And so um, so I do want to have kind of that direct um, conversation with them. And in the context, though, of kind of the teens that I see in general. Um, and then I'll say to them that that they often, um, the, the teens who I hear that from do believe actually that they don't need it. Um, and so I'm, I'm certainly not refuting that. Um, but I, I then say the thing is, is that one of the main reasons that they feel that they don't need it um, is because oftentimes they don't know any anything different. Um, and so I get kind of serious here and I say, you know, it's, it's been like this for so long that um, they often don't even know what they're missing. Um, and it also might feel scary to them. Um, to have to think about, you know, a kind of an alternative or doing the hard work that would be involved in getting to that point. Um, and at the same time, it's just, it, it might just be too hard to imagine and avoidance is easier. And so again, kind of validating that totally makes sense. Um, and it makes sense even that your brain has kind of convinced you that avoidance is easier and that this is the way to go. And then I'll say deep down, I think every teen that I've worked with who has selective mutism knows that SM is making their life harder. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the ways in which SM is making their life harder um, and to kind of tie that back into, again, the other teens that, um, that I work with. 
Um, and then I'll, um, I'll say something like, so like you might be wondering, or, you know, other people might wonder, ask me like, wait, like, why, why do you do this? If like, no one wants to see you, if, like, no one wants to actually get treatment. Um, and then I'll say to them, this is, this is, um, my way of kind of instilling hope in them and, and combating some of those thoughts that I, that I'm almost certain they have, but obviously are not going to articulate. So I'll say I, I do it because, um, almost all of the kids who, you know, who I have worked with, who have put in the work and, um, you know, who were motivated and who made that effort, um, in the end ended up being happier and having more fulfilled lives, um, and being glad that they did. And so that, that's why I do this because I've seen, um, I've seen so many teens be able to overcome this when they put in the work and I've seen, um, that their lives have, you know, have just drastically improved because of it. So that's why I do it because I see that it works. Um, so again, in that way, I'm kind of instilling that hope in them, but at the same time I say to them, you know, I, I get that, that that's hard to believe right now. Um, and I get that that's hard to trust because you just met me. Um, and so it's going to take a little, a little bit of time and a little bit of practice to see that that's the direction it can go in. And I would say the other teens who, um, who kind of started at the same point as you, um, also didn't think that things were going to change. Um, and now they're in a completely different place because they, they put in that work and then I'll make some sort of joke of like, yeah, you know, you're going to thank me. You're going to thank me afterwards, but I know you don't know it right now, but, <laughs> but you will. Um, so <clears throat> then I go on to kind of explain the process, um, and, and the idea of collaboration. So, um, I explained that obviously the only way to, you know, to overcome this stuff is to, is to face it and challenge it. And so it, it does involve hard work. Um, but I also want to kind of ease their anxiety about being kind of thrown into just overwhelming situations. So I say to them, I'm, I'm going to make a few promises to you. Um, and I say, I, this will always be collaborative. Um, I will never have you do anything that's too hard. I will never have you do anything that's overwhelming. If there's anything that I suggest that's too hard. Hard, um, or that I am too hard, that is my fault, and we scale it back. Um, and that's that's exactly how we're going to do it. We're going to take these small steps, and we take as many steps as we need to get there. Um, then I say, um, I also am going to promise you that I'm going to do everything I can to make it fun, because I know that um, that we're going to be doing hard work, and I want to balance that out. Um, and in the context of doing that we typically have a good time. And then the third thing that I, that I mentioned to them is a reward system. And I explain, like, I know, you know, some teens might think that a reward system seems babyish. Um, and it, that is so far from the truth here because you're going to be doing hard work. And when we do hard work, we get, we get rewarded. Um, and you're going to, you're going to deserve it. Um, so I'll explain that system. Then I'll say, all right, so let's take a minute and uh, get to know each other. So in advance, I have them fill out um, like an all about me form. This is before I meet them for the first time. Um, and it asks about every possible favorite, interest, YouTuber, TikToker, whatever new social media is out, um, favorite movies, shows, desserts, um, so that I have a lot to kind of pull from. Um, and so then I will use this time to build rapport and to kind of connect with them again, not asking them any questions. Um, but I'll say something like, Oh, you know, I see that you're a cat person. So, you know, you, you might love to hear the story about how I, 
brought home a stray cat from a Caribbean island and then, you know, I'll tell, <laughs> true story. Um, so I'll tell them that story and, and that kind of sucks them in. Um, and then I'll say like, oh yeah, I see that you also really like desserts. I like, I have a horrible sweet tooth and so you and I are gonna get along well. And I get, you know, some little smiles here and there. Um, and I'll also maybe ask the parents some questions if there is, um, you know, something that I want to know more about with the, with uh, the kid based on their interest sheet, but I definitely will not ask um, the teen directly. Um, then this is how they usually end is I will say to them, um, all right, so what we're going to do now, I want you to see kind of how this system works. And um, the idea of this is really to have them um, experience a successful um, a successful exposure um, and to show them that um, it's probably not as bad as they're thinking um, and to kind of make this whole experience less threatening and um, and a bit more predictable for them. So I will say to them, so the next time we meet, um, you're going to answer a question to one of your parents. Um, and I'm gonna give I'm gonna give you two possible questions to choose from. You're not gonna answer now. You're gonna answer them in the at the next video session. Um, and it's gonna require a one word answer. Um, you're gonna know it in advance. You're gonna be able to practice with your parents if you want. Um, and I don't even really have to hear you. Um, but you're as long as your parents hear you. So then I will offer them two questions. It might be like, um, at what age, I'll also do something like thumbs up or thumbs down if you know what age you started to ride a unicycle. Um, and they'll give me a thumbs up or down. Um, and then I'll say, you know, like thumbs up or thumbs down if you have a favorite character from the office. Um, so they'll give me a thumbs up or down. And so then I'll say, okay, so question one is, um, what age did you start riding a unicycle? Question two, what's your favorite character from the office? Show me one or two, which one do you want to answer to mom or dad next time? Um, and so they'll show me one or two. Um, and then I say, great, let's schedule the next one. Um, and that's it. So then the next one is usually like no more than five minutes. Um, I'll just chat with the parents for a few minutes with, you know, with the team there. And then I'll say, all right, mom or dad, go ahead and ask the question. Um, and then we do a couple of those and take those small steps to get the team to say one word to me um, and answer one of my questions. And usually um, by that point, they're feeling really good, really hopeful. Um, and we're able to kind of use from that, wow, you've already spoken to me, you've already taken these steps. Um, and so they've already experienced kind of the process before I even meet them. Um, and so when they come in um, for the first time, they're in a very different place. So I'm gonna stop there and see if anyone has any questions because um, I know I just gave a lot of information. Yes, we actually have a ton of questions coming in. So I know just for everybody, thank you so much. We won't be able to get to all of these. And so Shelly or someone else will definitely be responding later. So if your question doesn't get answered, don't worry, it will get answered in the future. So let me ask a couple or I'll share a couple of just quick ones. Um, one of them is, do you actually label it selective mutism to the kids? Do you use that term to them? That's a great question. Um, so I actually ask the parents during our intake, how they've described it to their kids and if they have used um, those terms before. Um, I encourage parents to be open with their kids about it. Um, and so if they have not yet had that conversation with their kids, then I always um, ask them to have that conversation um, before our first prep session so that we're able to use that language. Um, and right. you know, it, it's a way of kind of just normalizing it um, and talking about it without kind of needing to beat around the bush, which I think would make them feel even more anxious or stigmatized around it. I agree, I'm, I'm very direct in that way too. Yeah. Um, a couple of people asked, how long does that first prep session typically take? How long would you schedule that for? 
30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay. Yep. Great. Yeah. It's uh, I schedule it for 30 minutes and it, I mean, it, like clockwork, it's 30 minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, what happens when the team does not want to articulate anything in response to the two practice questions? What mm -hmm. if they were to, to verbalize anything? In the subsequent prep, because they're, yeah, because they don't do, I mean, usually here's the thing. If, if they are giving me, if they're selecting one or two, then that means they're going to do it. Um, and so I would say that it doesn't usually happen that way because I only move forward with the prep sessions if I know that there's some hook that we have um, for the team to be motivated. And so if that's not the case, if they're 100% resistant, then I would say you need to go back to the parent sessions um, and kind of uh, coach and adjust accordingly so that there's a little bit more motivation to change. But, but usually by the end of this prep session, when they, because I only introduce it at the end, and at this point, you know, we've already kind of gone through all of these skills of instilling hope, of um, kind of decatastrophizing it, of validating and normalizing um, and building some rapport. And so by the end of this for first prep session, um, it's, it's, I don't know that I've ever actually had a situation where they haven't, um, where they haven't chosen a question to answer. Now, now, that's not to say that the prep sessions always go smoothly. Um, so we might not get a kid or we, every kid I would say, you know, is, is trying, but it might take much smaller steps um, in order to get to that point. So that might involve um, you know, answering the parent with their hand up and then answering the parent um, you know, with their hand down and then moving the chairs apart a little bit. It might involve turning the uh, monitor away from me. It might involve turning the monitor away from them. Um, so, so we're taking these small steps, um, but we're setting it up so that they are successful at the end of each new step. Um, I think once or twice I've needed to use some sort of contingency plan. Um, where, you know, in order for them to have access to their, you know, we have to do the prep session or they have to, um, you know, do whatever their task was in the prep session in order to then have their iPad access. And so they can, you know, they can get that right after they finish their prep session. Um, so, so that's the, if, if you're really getting a ton of resistance, then it, it then you can just build in a contingency plan. So you just gave an example of sort of a, a little like contingency um, reward system, like you get your iPad after participating in this. So one of the questions was about um, setting up successful reward systems with teens. And I also struggle with that, that it's so much easier with young kids. There are so many rewards that they want. Um, personally, I find that it almost always comes down to screen time with teens. Um, but that was one of the questions that was submitted about um, setting up a good reward system. So have you, besides screen time, <laughs> do you have any kind of like, you know, more generalized ideas that people could use? Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of it revolves around electronics, though. So either like getting like a new device or um, <laughs> something like that. Um, but it's, I mean, it, it just totally varies. And I would say we want to make the distinction between like a contingency versus a reward. So if we're using screen time um, in a way that I was was mentioning before of like, you know, you can get this when you get this, then we're just really using it as a contingency. Um, and so I just want to make that distinction clear because I don't want them to think that, that they're getting kind of a, a reward when we set it up that way. Um, but, you know, other rewards can be anything from like, a you know, a nice, COVID, a nice restaurant or dinner takeout, um, or, you know, some sort of dessert. I always ask, like, you know, what do they get dessert every night? You know, what whatever kind of their special treats are that they enjoy but don't frequently get. So I'll kind of assess that with the parents. Um, it might be, 
you know, going to an amusement park. Um, it might be, you know, a spa day. Um, <laughs> we just submitted a suggestion for that gift cards are good rewards. That's a great gift idea. Cards, yep. Yeah, always good. Okay, thank you. Those are great ideas. And I know Some you have just want money and like, you know, that's yeah. what they want. Then we, I'm, I'm not opposed yeah. to building that in. <laughs> You know, I want to let you continue on, Shelly. So I'm just going to say I've got a lot of questions that relate to remote learning, which I also, I think all of us, you know, are, are obviously adapting our, our interventions to virtual sessions and, and remote learning. And so as you're talking over the next few slides, if anything comes to mind, that would be appropriate specifically for those questions about virtual learning. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah, sure. Um, one, one quick question. Are you talking about virtual sessions um, with the patient or virtual learning with the teacher? The questions that are coming in are mostly relating to how to motivate teens who to work on participating in virtual school, basically. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is all kind of setting up the framework. Um, and then building motivation into treatment. Great. <laughs> nice segue. Um, so this is this is kind of more general, um, but going back to the idea of collaborative goal, goal setting, um, I'm continuously referring back to what they've been able to kind of identify um, as their goals. I actually have a sheet that um, has different goals um, that they might, that I think it covers like the full spectrum of possible goals that they might have. Um, and I ask them to check off their top three. Um, and so even if, again, I'm not asking them to kind of identify their own goals, um, but even if they're not able to kind of articulate it or even identify it, um, they're able to off of a checklist check off three, um, and that then gives you some sort of direction as to what their priorities are, um, which is which is always nice. Um, and so then you can kind of continue to refer back to that um, anytime you're introducing a new task or exposure um, and kind of uh, talk about, you know, what their goals are and how to get there and where they currently are with that. Um, everything that I do involves giving them choices. Um, and so I, you know, I won't ever say like, here's your next task. It's always, okay, so do you want to do this or this next? Um, is this or this harder? Um, if we're choosing between this kid and this kid, let's, you know, let's pick. Um, and so they always feel like they are, you know, in charge of kind of making the decision um, and that they do have agency in this. Um, so in terms of the treatment activities, during treatment, um, I always start with a warm up. Um, again, like each time you're starting with teens um, or any kid with selective mutism, um, especially if there's a week between sessions, it can sometimes feel like um, you're starting, you kind of need that warm up um, to get back to where you were before. Um, and you don't want them to associate therapy with, you know, to sheer misery. Um, and so this is a way that they can start to kind of perceive therapy as fun. I am very, very, very particular about the games that I use for warm up. So I bought a ton of new games um, based on their interest sheets because um, I don't want to just kind of throw options at them that are not um, of interest to them. And so if there are games on their interest sheet that I don't have, I'll get it. Um, you know, anything that they write in terms of, I've, I've have played Roblox. I'm, I'm now like an expert at Roblox. Um, so I've done that the last like four weeks with a patient. Um, so it, it's really based on exactly like what they enjoy. Um, in terms of the hierarchy. Okay. So this is a question that a lot of people have is, you know, how do we establish a hierarchy? Um, when, you know, when we have a teen who is not super motivated, you know, there's a little bit at this point, but not super motivated. And they're certainly not going to articulate, um, you know, the things that make them anxious and, um, and kind of generate their own situations. Um, and so what I do is, I'm just going to go to this screen here. If you look on the left, um, 
this is a teens hierarchy um, and I generate um, 10 to 12 situations um, based on my the information that I gathered from the intake with the parent and everything that I know about the child. Um, and so I have, I mean, you don't have to kind of use this, <laughs> the same system here, but it's uh, Velcro and so they're able to, and you could do this obviously remotely as well. Um, so they, they then have to rank easiest to hardest, but they don't have to verbalize anything and they don't have to generate anything. Um, and this is really a great way, again, to kind of see what their order of difficulty is um, and to get buy-in from them when they fully understand that like we're starting with the easiest thing that's that um, you know you're able to do and we're gonna work our way up um, and so this is a nice way to again to give them some agency in it and for them to kind of understand the process and through them being able to kind of rank the order of this um, they're they're then getting more motivation um, about you know kind of the way in which this is being approached um, the other thing that I do in treatment is cognitive restructuring. Um, again, how is that, how do you do that with uh, teens with selective mutism who are not going to say, oh, you know, here's my anxious thought. Um, <laughs> when I, when my heart starts to race, then, you know, I think to myself, I wonder what my, what my automatic thought is right now. So you're not going to get any of that. Um, and so what I've done here, and you guys are kind of happy to, or you're welcome to use this. Um, so this is kind of a list of different possible thoughts that they might have. So these are all examples here. What if they don't hear me? My voice will sound weird. They're going to laugh at me. Everyone's attention will be on me if I talk. Um, and this is a great way to get information um, from teens with selective mutism who probably do have some awareness of this. Maybe it's something that they haven't thought about before. Um, and it's definitely not something that they would articulate. But um, when it's in front of them and when they're able to kind of look at this and select which apply to them, um, they have really shown a lot of insight. Um, and are able to check off the ones that are relevant to them. Um, and then we have a really good sense of then what we might need to then kind of directly challenge with them. Um, and yeah, if, they, if they're able to come up with them on their own, then great, but uh, usually we need to, to go this route. Um, in terms of homework, Again, I, I, I use their, their hierarchy that they ranked to drive that, and I always provide options. Um, so again, they feel like they're in control. Um, I'm just being mindful of the time here. I know we just have a couple more minutes. Um, I wanna just touch on peers, um, because I know, Allison, that's a question that you had asked. Um, so that's that's where we often get the most resistance because um, this is this is where there's the most room for judgment and the most room for them to kind of feel embarrassed um, or, or um, single out. And so I would say the main the the main thought that I challenge um, with them is, and again, it kind of helps to understand what they're afraid of, um, but a lot of times it is that the attention will be on them. Um, and so I will challenge this um, by kind of letting them know that they, um, and I'll, I'll engage them actually non-verbally in this, so I'll say, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down if you know, if you think that um, the other kids in your class know that you don't talk, um, thumbs up. And so then I'll ask questions like that to kind of get them to see that, um, that the kids already know what's going on um, with them and they are aware that, you know, that the teen doesn't talk and they're aware of the struggles that the teen has. Um, and so it's not like this is going to reveal anything. Um, and then I do a lot of challenging around, okay, so if you, you know, talk for the first time and they hear your voice for the first time, um, do you think that they're gonna be um, you know, as excited about it a month from now, six months from now, thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, and so I'm getting them through that process to kind of understand um, by you know, challenging those cognitions that 
um, you know, there's going to be indefinite attention on them um, or that they won't be able to get through um, that level of anxiety when that happens. Um, the other thing that I have, um, that I've done that I found has been really effective is if we do, so I, I have parents and teachers identify, um, you know, the kids in the class who seem nice and the kids in the class who seem, you know, drawn to the teen with selective mutism. Um, I'll even have that teen, um, I'll have them in the assessment here that I wrote, I'll have them identify kids who sit next to them in each class, kids who maybe they used to talk to but don't talk to anymore, kids who maybe, um, you know, they have smiled at before um, so that I kind of understand their full um, spectrum of, op of options. Um, and then, you know, I'll again involve them in, in the process, have them kind of rank um, who they want. If there are parents um, who are friends with each other and have peers the same age, that's often my starting point. I've told parents before, like, make friends <laughs> um, with, you know, parents of kids in your, in your teen's class, um, because that's a much more natural way to do it is, you know, if the parents just have the family over. Um, but if it's a kid who hasn't, you know, who hasn't spoken to peers before and they're worried about the peers reaction, um, when we're starting with new peers, I have actually said, or had, a, had the parent say to, um, to that peer, uh, so and so, you know, is going to be, you know, talking in front of you or talking to you. And here's what I need from you. I need you to react as if nothing's happening um, and to um, not even acknowledge the fact that, you know, that they're talking right now. And once the team that I'm working with knows that the peer knows to do that, and that the peers not going to be reacting. I've had a number of teens who have been much more open um, to starting to verbalize if they know they're not going to be getting that reaction that they're dreading. Okay. I left yes. you guys four seconds for Q and A. <laughs> Since we started like two minutes late, I'm hoping that we can maybe just spend like a couple minutes. Um, yeah, me on too. So um, someone wants you to write a book, so just keep that in mind. Um, hopefully there's a book coming with um, session by session outlines, which would be great. That's, um, that's uh, the plan when I catch up with all of my existing work. <laughs> awesome. all right, we will wait for that with bated breath. Um, I'm very excited for that book to come out, Shelly, so as soon as you can get to work on that. Um, a lot of people are really interested to know whether you would be willing, and I think it's totally fine if you're not willing, but if you are, willing to share any of these predetermined sort of lists of cognitions, lists of, you know, um, on the hierarchy, challenges, things like that. So that's Absolutely. something that if you're willing to do, I'm sure, you know, we can get that to people. Yeah. Um, and anything you want to say about virtual learning, just that you found so I would it? Say, um, build, build that into the hierarchy um, and make those situations that um, that they're gonna have to rank um, and then you know at, at some point they're going to get to it and whatever smaller steps you need to break it down into um, then you'll do but again at that point you'll have some buy-in um, from you know from the patient from doing easier tasks with them um, but I think that everything that we talked about could apply to that um, in terms of, you know, challenging some of the cognitions that they identify that they have, um, in terms of, you know, building it into the hierarchy, and even in terms of kind of identifying their goals, um, and, um, and then kind of the discrepancy in where they're at now and what they're currently doing. So play on that kind of that interference um, hook that, that you get from them. And along those lines, um, so someone asked whether having the camera, whether teachers requiring students to have cameras on could be heightening anxiety for students with SM. Just I'll speak to that for a moment. That's something I've worked with in this um, throughout the spring with my teens with SM is one, you know, the first step on their hierarchy may just be having their camera on. Yeah. That they're not verbally participating or even in the chat box. 
or we might start with the chat box then camera on. So I don't know if you have anything different or additional on that one. Yeah, yeah, and I think that goes back to like what you were what you were just describing that you kind of break it down into as small steps as needed. And again, speaking, you know, speaking to motivation, that helps them see like you're on my side, you're on my team, right? If we're saying like nope, just turn on your camera and, you know, raise your hand, raise your virtual hand and, you know, answer this question they're going to be like, you're out of your mind. But, but if we say, okay, so that's too hard. Let's think about this. Let's scale it back. Okay. So if we're choosing, but if we're thinking about doing this or this, which one of those two, one or two, which one would be easier? Um, and so, so you're really working with them um, to get them to, you know, a level that they're able to do, obviously with them knowing that it's still going to be challenging um, but once they see that you're on their team it makes it much easier to um, you know to move them forward and, and one big way to do that is by breaking it down into those small steps exactly so for all the other great questions that we have we'll make sure to get great answers to you thank you so much for everyone that submitted questions I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to everything there are a good number um, so we'll be taking a look at those. Thank you so much, Dr. Abney. This was incredibly helpful. You gave such great specific ideas. I will definitely be utilizing these starting Monday. Um, so I am sure everyone in the audience really appreciates your time. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And if you guys have any additional questions that you think of um, kind of after the fact, then feel free to email me. Um, so I'm always, I'm always happy to, to share whatever knowledge I have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thanks for attending. Thanks, Dr. Miller.